Quanta saudade antiga, quanta recordação. São Paulo, Brasil. The largest city in South America, fifth largest in the world. With a population of 13 million in its metropolitan area, São Paulo is also the industrial commercial capital of Brazil. Founded by Jesuit missionaries in the 16th century, São Paulo was for a time an obscure little village, since the major cities at the time were all seaports, serving the booming sugar trade. Towards the 18th century, São Paulo slowly gained importance as a headquarters for these men, the Bandeirantes, who ventured into the interior of Brazil to hunt for slaves and, later, to search for gold. The Bandeirantes were true Brazilian pioneers, but two centuries later, a different group of pioneers came and made a significant contribution to the development of this country. Today we'll find out more about these new pioneers as we look at Asians in Brazil. For Brazilians, the term Asian is virtually synonymous with Japanese. In fact, most outsiders may be surprised at the vital role played by this seemingly remote Far Eastern culture in the socio-economic life of Brazil. The history of the Japanese in this country is actually a recent one. The first immigration of significant numbers came in 1908. 781 Japanese traveling on a Russian hospital ship arrived in a port of Santos near São Paulo. They were mostly farm workers bound for the coffee plantations in São Paulo state and nearby Paraná. In fact, up until World War II, 99% of the Japanese coming to Brazil worked in agriculture. Gradually, through diligence and farm skills, the Japanese came to rent and own land and diversified into crops other than coffee, especially fruits and vegetables. They also brought with them a cohesive social structure, which proved most adaptable to the new land. Groups of farmers would band together into cooperatives, which provided economies of scale for the purchasing of land, farm materials and equipment, and also for the marketing of harvested crops. These cooperatives provided a way for immigrant farmers to avoid exploitation by local go-betweens and landowners. The second major wave of Japanese immigration came after the Second World War. During the 50s, the vast richness of the Brazilian soil once again offered the promise of a fresh start for farmers like Shochishiro Komorita. In 1953, he came to Brazil and signed a four-year contract with a large cooperative to work on a farm. Then, with the money he saved, he began to work on land he acquired on a leased land basis. Twenty-five years ago, he bought 100 acres to grow strawberries and potatoes. He later switched to a more profitable and predictable crop, lettuce. Now he produces some 400 boxes of lettuce a week, providing a steady income to support his large family. Komorita has two sons and a daughter from his first marriage to a Brazilian woman, and three more children from his current marriage to a Japanese. Sueli is his daughter from the first marriage. She works in a bank during the week and helps out on the farm on weekends. Mr. Komorita also has several Brazilian employees. Although he allows his children to choose their own lives, he believes that their futures lie somewhere other than on the lettuce farm. <laughs> The harvested lettuce is brought to this place by the truck load. It is São Paulo's largest wholesale market for farm produce. Many of the farm cooperatives that do business here are operated by people of Japanese descent. A quick scan of the faces in the market will confirm that fact. You may think this is Tokyo, 
but I'm actually standing in the heart of Sao Paulo. The fact is, Brazil has the largest Japanese community outside Japan. This district in Sao Paulo is called Liberdade, the Portuguese word for liberty. For the Japanese, but the Chinese and Koreans as well, Brazilian society does offer the liberty to trade and prosper while preserving many traditions of their native culture. After all, few countries have instances of ethnic minorities rising to such levels of social and political power as in Brazil. A case in point is Shigeaki Ueki, a second-generation Japanese Brazilian who has served as the country's Minister of Energy and also the president of Petrobras, the national oil company. Was it difficult for a person of your ethnic background to rise to such positions of power? I think uh, in Brazil we have a different social environment, political and social environment. We have a lot of uh, second generation occupying important positions in the country. For instance, uh, Petrobras, that I had been chairman for almost six years, the Petrobras is considered one of the most nationalist symbols in the country. Mm. And uh, as Japanese descendant or Asian descent to be president of Petrobras, is a, is a one fact that in other countries outside Brazil, everybody they ask it to me, how you can be president of Petrobras or national oil company? And I all, always I say only in Brazil can, can, <laughs> can understand it. Uh, second generation of uh, not only Japanese, I, I can say Chinese or Italian, Spanish, Portuguese, any nationality. They became 100% Brazilian in Brazil. You speak and write Japanese. I can speak Japanese, but unfortunately I cannot uh, write or read only hiragana and katakana. Uh, now, how about your children? Oh, my children understand Japanese, so, and, but unfortunately they can't speak. They're so. worse than you. <laughs> They're worse, but you're right. <laughs> Located in a middle-class section of Sao Paulo, the Sino Brasileiro is the oldest and best-known Chinese restaurant in the city. The name means Chinese Brazilian, quite appropriate considering the story of Betty Ong, the woman who owns and operates the restaurant. A Shanghainese woman of 66, Mrs. Ong traveled on a boat for nearly two months to come to Brazil in 1951. She came with her husband and two small children. Her husband went into the textile business. Mrs. Ong was a career woman with a sociology degree from Suzhou University. She wasn't meant to be a housewife in a foreign country where there were hardly any Chinese people and very few well-educated professional women. When I came to Brazil, then I got very alone. So then I was very sick. So then I went to the doctor. Then he checked up my whole body and he said, <laughs> not the physical sickness. It was something in your head. So finally I found that two Chinese maids also came from China. So then we three of us uh, decide to have the Chinese boarding house. Uh -huh. yeah. So we start the Chinese boarding house. Uh, then I, the two made uh, have the, made the Chinese cook. Then I do the administration part. So in the boarding house, then we receive all Chinese people, and we read together, and we have our food together, and since. That time I forgot China. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I'm, my homesick was cured, you see. After a year or so, Mrs. Ong rented this house and closed down the boarding house to start the Sino Brasileiro restaurant, which celebrated its 30th anniversary in 1984. Since your restaurant was the first Chinese restaurant in Sao Paulo, how did the Brazilians receive Chinese food? The first impression of Chinese food they think it's very poor food. Afterwards, some Chinese came here. They like to have their factory and they have some import export business. They invite many bankers and uh, some important people to come here. Mm -hmm. After they finish the dinner, 
Then they told the host, may I tell you the truth? He said, you know, our impression, the Chinese food, very poor. And it's the raw fish, and it should sit on the floor, uh -huh. because they all make confused with the Japanese, Japanese food. Uh -huh. And when we finish our dinner, that's very rich food and very good food. Will you please invite us again? Instead of 12 people, I should put 14 uh -huh. chairs. You uh -huh. see, they appreciate so much. Uh -huh. Today, the Sino Brasileiro opens its doors to a distinguished clientele. Mrs. Ong, who has become a prominent figure in the San Paulo community, has no thoughts of retiring. Because of the friendship of the, my customers, I think I still work. The customers, not only customers, they are already friends. Mrs. Ong mastered Portuguese soon after settling here, and she has used this skill and her good standing in the community to help new immigrants settle in Brazil. Her pioneering work has helped many, but the 80,000 Chinese who live here are still a minority. Zhu Pengnian was a school teacher in Beijing before he moved with his wife and children to São Paulo three years ago. The transition was a fairly smooth one. Mrs. Ju's brother and his family had lived in Brazil for years, so the new country did not seem too alien or unfriendly. It also helped that Mr. Ju is multi-talented. He not only teaches at the Chinese Language Institute, but he also writes articles for Chinese newspapers and practices Chinese massage and acupuncture skills, which he had acquired in China. So it was not difficult for him to make friends with both Chinese and Brazilians here. Recently, when Premier Zhou Ziyang visited São Paulo, Mr. Zhu attended a banquet in honor of the occasion as an established member of the local Chinese community. Today, the Jews live in this house which they own, and the children are so acclimated to their new life that they often speak to each other in Portuguese. Still, there's a note of melancholy underlying this successful transition made by the family. Mr. Zhu becomes quite sentimental whenever he speaks of his childhood in China, and in some of his articles, his writing conveys a sense of displacement at the changes brought about by moving to his new environment. His love for his native country is perhaps best expressed by this song he composed. According to a recent survey, there are now four million people of Asian descent in Brazil. And while a large concentration of Asians can be found in the São Paulo area, we must admit that the few whom we met are not necessarily representative of all Asians in Brazil. Still, if generalizations were to be made, one might say that Asians do play a significant role in the socio-economic fabric of Brazil, that they are perceived as industrious and enterprising, that they share in a sense of national pride and are working for a common future, a society in which their children and children's children are not perceived as Japanese Brazilian, Chinese Brazilian, or Korean Brazilian, but simply as Brazilian. Yeah.